Hey family, God bless you. Good evening. Let me know when you are in here. God bless you guys. Hallelujah. Woo. Come on and let me know when you're here. Feel your promise. I'm gonna. Woo. Bless Jesus. Y'all come on in. Let me see you. Get on in in here. It's been a while. I almost forgot how to operate this thing. But um, come on, it's going to be a great session this evening. Hallelujah. Hey, Brother Dale Bowers, God bless you. I miss you. I was actually telling Pastor Coffee about you today. God bless you. Y'all come on in. Hey, Deaconess Loretta, we miss you so much. God bless you. We really, really miss you, Deaconess. I know you went to celebrate with our family. But my Lord, we missed you. Bless God. Y'all come on in. Let me know when you're here. Start sharing. Let me know if you can hear me clearly. Hey, Kaya, God bless you. Hey, Miss Sherry Leland, God bless you. God bless you guys. Y'all come on in. It is time for Power Monday evening empowerment. Come on, let's jump on in. I know we have daddy daughter shortly, so I'm gonna see how much of this I can get done, huh? Y'all come on in. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hey Kazani. God bless you, sweetheart. Pastor Damieta, God bless you. So great to see you, family. I'm smiling so much, it's hurting from right here because I actually really miss you guys and I haven't seen y'all in such a long time. I actually almost forget how to do all of this. But, uh, you know, we've been back. We're happy. We're refreshed. Hallelujah. Jesus, we're ready to work. So, y'all get on in. Don't forget to share. Bless the Lord. Welcome, welcome. Don't forget to share. Hey, my sister in love, Prudence. God bless you. Tanisha Sanderson. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hey, Gailey, I love you. Oh, my God. My spirit has been so blessed. And so refreshed. Hallelujah. Hello. I think that's Pastor Chris. God bless you, Pastor Chris. I see you're logged in through your page. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, Tisha. God bless you, cuz. Y'all come on in, family. Come on in, all our sons and daughters. God bless you. Tag somebody. Oh, Auntie Mercedes. I miss you. Oh, my goodness. I miss you. Come on in, y'all. Come on in. God bless you guys. Get on in. Hey, Prophet Craig, so good to see you. It's going to be turned up today. Turned up. Totally. Totally. <laughs> hey, Michael Scott, Minister Scott, God bless you. Hey, Sister Shanita Clark, God bless you. I see that you're there. Barbara Pittman, God bless you. Mommy Carmen Hudson, God bless you. Hallelujah. God bless you guys. Y'all come on in. I want to officially go ahead and welcome you to our Power Monday Evening Empowerment right here at Open Fire International Fellowship. I am your assistant pastor, April Coffee. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. I'm so excited to be back. I could not wait to be back with you guys. Bless the Lord. I want to welcome you again. Thank you so much for sharing. If this is your first time, please to let us know. Bless the Lord. I want to go ahead and while we're jumping in, give a very big shout out, an absolute greeting of honor, and a very, very happy birthday to our dear senior pastor, Dr. Lincoln George Coffey. Hallelujah. Pastor Coffey, God bless you. We love you. I hope you guys remember today was his birthday. He's so appreciating the text messages and the gestures, the gifts, the love. Pastor Coffey, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you. We are praying your strength. God bless you. Hallelujah. God bless you. To my Open Fire family, I love you guys. Hey, Nikki, you know you got a dear place in my heart. The Brutons family, I love you guys. Daviel, I see you. Please to give Shiloh my love. Play this part of the video so she can hear that Nana called her name. It's important. All right? And give her a greeting for me. Okay, you do that. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Auntie Janetta, God bless you. Pastor Johnson, I see you. Y'all come on in. Hey, Dad, I see Pastor Coffee. 
Yeah, come on in. Let's bless the Lord. I'm just going to run right ahead. We are going to pray while you're sharing. I want for you to begin to engage. Hallelujah. It's going to be lit. It's totally in my Donald Trump impersonation. It's totally going to be lit. All right. Totally. <laughs> okay, guys. What we're going to do is we want to enter into this realm in a moment of prayer. We want to bring this moment and this time to the Holy Spirit so that the Lord can do just exactly what he designed to be done on today. Hallelujah. Father, we just honor you. We just bless you. We exalt you in this place. We are so happy to be able to wait upon you because the Bible said that those who wait upon the Lord will not be disappointed. And we just want to thank you for the opportunity to wait upon you that we no longer have to do it in our own strength. We want to honor you. We want to bless you. Thank you for being in our midst. We welcome you in our hearts, in our minds, and in our understanding. We thank you for your counsel. We thank you for your grace. And we just exalt you and we bless you right now in the name of Jesus. Think through my mind. Let understanding, let revelation come. I so desperately need the strength of your Holy Spirit upon my inner man and my natural man oh god we thank you and so we honor you and we bless you and we give you praise and glory bless the people cover the people and strengthen the people on today it is in jesus name we proclaim that now put your hands together and put a praise in the chat and let's exalt jesus come on for 30 seconds i'm giving you guys 30 seconds to throw some praise out to the king of glory just say something good about Jesus right here in this chat right now. Whatever it is that he's done, you want to thank him for his peace. You want to thank him for his love, his grace, his favor, his forgiveness, his compassion. Hallelujah. Come on now, somebody. It's going to be good. But come on, I'm giving you that 30 seconds. That's it. Thank you, Jesus, for being Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. For never leaving us, nor forsaking us. Hallelujah. We bless his name. We praise him. We love him. Oh, we honor you, Jesus. You are so faithful. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hey, by the way, uh, Tamisha, this is what you're going to do for me, uh, sis. Prudence, make sure to get Jennifer and the whole crew on up in here. All right, because I miss them and I haven't seen them. Okay. All right. God bless you guys. So here we go, people of God. I want to run ahead and start our teaching on this evening. Thank you, guys. I feel the love going up for our Savior. I sense the atmosphere of praise in this, vir in this virtual world that we're in. Bless the Lord. So, um, you know, we, we the last time I was with you guys before I left to go be with my husband for like three weeks on the road with him, driving eight hours to and from, just trying to just get some shifts covered because they had uh, an emergency at his job. And so, you know, he had to really help the director there. So he was like, he's so lonely. Uh, I know he's listening. And he was like, he's lonely. He don't want to be without his wife. And so, you know, what's a wife supposed to do when she hears her husband say that? <laughs> and so, you know, we've been together, but we've been refreshed. We are charged up. We're on fire and we are ready to work. I'm telling you, yesterday's service was so powerful. Indeed, Pastor Coffee has blessed us. He continued the series on the supernatural man. He's been dealing with the threefold dimension of mankind, the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. And boy, did he bless us. So I'm looking forward for the rest of that series. And this morning at 5 a.m., I've literally been praying and playing that prayer throughout my day because I was so refreshed and empowered from our moment with the Lord this morning. Bless God. Uh, but today we are going to continue in a teaching I started the last time I was with you on practicing personal integrity. I have like 14 Power Mondays lined up, literally. Like when I was away, I load myself up, right? So I have like 14 practical things that we can do and study, but I did not want to jump over this. Because I felt like we opened something and we needed to finish it, you know. So we are going to continue this evening on dealing with practical, um, practicing personal integrity. I want to be able to define 
integrity. I want to be able to help us to understand how to measure the level of integrity each person operates in and then how to actually make a practice of it. Hey, Leticia, God bless you, Brown. God bless you. And so, Jennifer, God bless you. Good to see you. I love you. Come on in. And tag your husband and tell him hi for me, Jen. God bless you. And so, um, and so we're gonna run with this. Now, I'm gonna kind of just go punchline for punchline, you know, with some stuff. So just stay engaged. Let me know that you're learning. Put the things in the chat and let me know that you're there. Hey, Nicole Booker, God bless you, sweetie. So I want to open up with the scripture because it's just really gonna be our anchor scripture. I'll give reference to everything else for the evening. And um and it reads, it says here, Galatians 5.25, Galatians 5.25, don't forget to share. And somebody who's helping me with the, um, with the writing in the scriptures, here we go. If we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, because we're Christians, right? And so if we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit. Don't just say you live by the Holy Ghost, but walk by the Holy Ghost too. All right, practice what we preach, uh-huh. And so he's telling us that in order to do that, we got to walk by the Spirit with personal integrity, which is to be godly character, moral courage, and conduct, which is empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read it again, just straight through. If we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit with personal integrity with personal integrity godly character and moral courage are uh, our conduct empowered by the holy spirit now again my objective in my time with you on this evening is to be able to define personal integrity i want to bring a spiritual yet practical everyday understanding of what integrity is so you can know you can measure your own spirit you can have an understanding huh, of how you're living your life in this level called integrity and then i want to be able to show you how do i know what my level and or quality or, or standard of integrity is and then how do i actively practice integrity as a child of god how do i actively practice integrity as a child of god don't forget to share Bless the Lord. How do I actively practice integrity as a child of God? So here we go. The first thing that I want to talk about before I jump into defining integrity, because as I talk about it, I'm going to really make it practical to us, right? By the grace of God, of course. Uh, the first thing that I want to identify is how Galatians chapter 5 and uh, 25 tells us that it, that the integrity that we walk in, the moral conduct, uh, moral courage that we walk in, it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. So one of the first things you're going to take in your notes, for those of you who are diligent and you take notes, bless the Lord, one of the first things you're going to take in your notes is the fact that my integrity must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, as Christians, our integrity integrity uh, cannot be measured our standard and quality and system and measurement by what we live and conduct ourselves morally or spiritually cannot be measured by our own standard because good for you might not be good for somebody else all right and um and so it is measured and it's also empowered by the spirit of god so every believer has the ability to walk in proper personal integrity i'm gonna say that again every believer have the ability to not be phony and and, and shaky in their character and in their moral standard because the holy spirit of jesus christ he empowers you and i to walk and to maintain a life of personal integrity did you just hear me write it in your own words and let me know you understand Mm. oh that water is so good bless jesus all right and so my integrity is empowered by the holy spirit obviously if our integrity is empowered by the holy spirit the question then is why it seems like christians walk in different level of integrity why does it seem like some christians have integrity and some don't that's because the level of the integrity that we walk in 
even though it is empowered by the Holy Spirit, it is measured by our obedience. I'm going to say it again. The level of integrity that we walk in as Christians, even though it is empowered by the Holy Spirit, it is measured by our obedience. And so the quality of integrity you will produce in your character has to come from your obedience to the Holy Spirit. So the reason why one Christian or believer will be stronger in the character or their integrity is because they're more submitted and more yielded to the Holy Spirit. If you're not submitted and you're not yielded to the Holy Spirit, chances are you'll be fake, phony, hypocritical, and quite frankly, very carnal, all right? And we understood on yesterday's teaching that carnality doesn't mean you're unsaved. It just means you're saved because Jesus is savior for you, but he's not Lord. So you sit on the throne of your life. You direct your own life, even though you're saved. And that's what carnality is. So if we want to have strong character, we have to be willing to be processed and we have to be willing to obey. So the measurement of your process and the measurement of your obedience is what's going to be the bedrock of who you are because that's the core of your integrity hallelujah so one of the things i want to bring to us is uh, the necessity of integrity why is integrity necessary number one it's it's necessary because the lord requires it what do i mean by that god wants you to walk in integrity god god requires it he's hunting it down he's looking for it his eyes are going to and from in your church, in your family, on your job, looking for somebody that has integrity on the inside of their spirit. In Psalm 51 verse 6, David is writing in a very repentant mode and he said, Behold, you, Jehovah, you desire truth in the innermost being, in my spirit, in my inward man, God desires honesty. He desires honesty and in the hidden part of my heart, he will cause me to know his wisdom. So, so the Lord desires honesty. That word honesty there in the Hebrew is not just telling the truth. It is not just, oh, I just tell the truth, but it's to walk in integrity, which is to be constant and truthful within your own self to your own person and to your own spirit. So the Lord requires brutal personal honesty on the inward part of a man. The Lord requires brutal honesty, brutal personal honesty on the inward part. I'm going to touch that further on, but I want to show you again the necessity of integrity. So that's integrity on a personal level. So for every person watching, every person that will watch, every person under the sound of my voice, and every believer absent or present, this is it. The Lord requires integrity on our inward part. Don't worry, it's about to get real good in a second. Just stick with me. He requires integrity on the inward part. So it also answers the question as to where does integrity lies with in the individual and so we know that it is part of the dna the spiritual makeup of the man because it's within your soul and within your spirit that's where your integrity is found so really and truly integrity is an internal and personal thing that is mirrored or reflected on the outside of our lives through our behavior or decision making etc etc all right and so number one integrity is necessary because god god requires it he requ it's not your pastor it's not your husband it's not your boss god requires uh, integrity it's just his standard integrity and honor comes from him the bible tells us and so he requires that we walk in integrity number two this is another major reason why integrity for the body of Christ is necessary to every individual and even on a corporate level. Like a whole church have to walk in integrity. Now I'm going to tell you why. Because a lot of the reasons why we're seeing so little of the power of God in the church is not that people are not praying and fasting. It's just that when we're done, we turn to our own ways. And so the thing is, we have the scales in our lives and in our ministries, they're not balanced. And when they're not balanced, the power of God cannot really come in the way that God really wants to come. He cannot come in the fullness of what he really wants to come in our churches because within individuals that we can lack integrity as an individual and affect the whole church. We saw that because we saw Achan. We saw how when Achan did what he did, 
and he sinned and stole from God that God the whole, the whole um, camp got affected. But we also saw when Ananias and Sapphira lied, but only they were the only one that died. Which means judgment and justice is measured in the hands of God. David said, you are just when you judge. You are righteous when you judge. Who can judge the judgment of the Lord? Because his justice and his judgments are pure. So at the end of the day, the Lord is going to require integrity on a personal level and on a corporate level. So of course on a personal level, that's kind of what we're going to deal with. But integrity here on a corporate level, let me show you this in Matthew 21 and verse 12 to 14. The Bible says, and Jesus entered into the temple of God, into the temple of God. All right, God's church, uh huh, where his place where his people gather and cast out all them that sold and brought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and seeds of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it in a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Okay, what, what, what does all of this mean? What does all of that have to do with anything? Now, notice how before Jesus drove out the money changers, drive the foolishness out of the church, drive out the lack of integrity. And I'm going to show you why there was a lack of integrity there, right? Before he did that, the blind and the lame were not coming to the temple to be healed. So, so a lot of the reason why we are not seeing, hey, Minister uh, Teresa, God bless you, Lady Teresa, I love you. So a lot of the reasons why we're not seeing people being healed, delivered, and set free in our local churches is because they're money changers. Now, what, what does money changers look like? Let me help you so it can be practical to your understanding so you'll have an idea of what we're talking about. Okay, say, for instance, we're in the church. Okay, I'm pastoring, right? And then... Money changers that Jesus drove out were people with an unbalanced scale. So their life was off balance. So therefore their scale was off balance. And as a result, they measure everything for everybody else off of an unbalanced scale. So they set the scale at, at their standard and they used to add false weight to the scale so that they can charge people more than what they themselves are willing to pay. And that's the problem with the whole integrity issue is you want people to live so 100% perfect, but you yourself can't even produce 2% good. You can't produce 2% or 10% good, but you want to hold people at a weight and a measurement that you create when you yourself or I myself, we're not able to keep those standards. And so the money changer speaks of people with imbalanced um, weight in the church. So, okay. So, all right. So I'm a leader, right? I can be a leader as a pastor or I'm over a department, but because me and Sue cool and we chill. So Sue went to the club all right now and Sue dropped it like it was all the way hot and she did not pick it back up and we saw her on Facebook all right and then because me and Sue are cool because of my friendship right I compromise this balance of God's word and so I don't sit Sue down because I'm afraid to you know really be upfront about letting her know her conduct is wrong and then um and then mary lou come over here and mary lou just barely um you know have an attitude in the fire and now oh my goodness mary lou i can't believe you had an attitude and now i sit mary lou down but because of my relationship with sue i, I don't sit sue down because my scale is off balance and so that's how we see in a lot of the churches where somebody can be possessed with a spirit of homosexuality Sexuality. And before you know it, a lot of the, men's in the, in the men in the church, they dominantly just wear that spirit. And the thing is, nobody never check it at the balance level. Before it went in the temple, nobody never measured the scale. And so now when that thing is in the church, it's just like Eli. Eli knew his sons were sleeping with the daughters. God never had a problem. Actually, God's problem wasn't so much with Eli's son as it was with Eli because he was the one in the place of authority to have corrected the issue in the church. Eli knew the sons were sleeping with the ushers and they were robbing God's offering. He knew it and people hated to come to the temple. Read your Bible. People hated to come to the temple because they were practicing 
this lack of integrity and so the name of God and the work of God is being affected and so when God went to Eli what Eli did was misbalance the scale he gave them a slap on the wrist oh you know sons I hear y'all are checking up sleeping around with the ladies in the back in the church y'all know y'all not supposed to really do that and what did God do kill all of them Kill all of them. And so Ichabod came. What does Ichabod mean? It means the glory of God has departed. I don't want the glory of God to depart from our ministry. I don't want the glory of God to depart from our lives. And so the only way to do that is to ensure that you practice personal integrity. Walking in active obedience to the word of God. And holding and owning your rightful place in Christ and in your spirit of personal upright righteousness and integrity. So I'm going to show you something that I don't know if you've ever been taught this before. It's actually in the Bible. It's very, very, I mean, it's kind of right there in front of you. But um, in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul was talking about the armor of God. So the breastplate of righteousness, if you read into those Greek words, you will realize that it's not it's not righteousness as in, oh, you know, righteousness. It's actually the breastplate of righteous integrity. So integrity is actually a part of the armor of God. I know it's brand new. You've probably never heard it before. But um, really, when you study it, you're going to realize that uprightness of the heart, integrity is a part of the armor of God. And so you can't allow one thing for somebody else or yourself and then don't allow it for others. We can't have the scale of our spirit unbalanced. And so here it is, we're not seeing personal revival and corporate moves of God because there's a lack of integrity. So now let's define this whole integrity thing. Let me help you to understand what integrity means. Because usually when we hear it, and you know, you say, we say in layman's term, oh, somebody, you know, they ain't got no integrity. Uh, it's, what we're saying is they're hypocritical, they're shady, they're false, they're not real, they're pretentious. Come on now, they got the spirit of pretense. They're Pharisees, they're hypocrites, they're whitewashed sepulchers, pretty on the outside, ugly on the inside. Layman spiritual terms, right? And so, uh, 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 and so, um, I guess, you know, in the new term right now, it's, it's, I hear this little thing going around. I, I'm, I'm probably gonna have to do some more research about it called the church girl. Oh my Lord, have mercy, Jesus. That's for a whole nother stuff. But it's that whole concept that you can live wretched. I mean, and, and how you want, and then come up in the church and think that there'll be no consequence. And the worst part about it is, when we live a certain kind of a way, we're not mindful of the fact that how we live and how we function can affect the people around us. All right? And so, um, so I want to define what integrity is. And so we want to put some stuff out there, not what I feel, not what I think. I'm subjected to obey this very word I'm given to you. I'm, I'm subjected to walk in it and to perfect it in my life. We work every day to perfect um, holiness and integrity in the fear of the Lord. So here we go. When we talk about integrity, number one, what is it that we want for you to understand? Integrity is personal inner honesty. Personal inner honesty honesty you got to be true to thine own self shakespeare come on now you got to be true to your own spirit you gotta be honest to yourself it's the bedrock of integrity even if you're lying even if you're crooked be honest that you're crooked it's integrity uh-huh it means you're not split you know you're wicked you know you, you, it's like a witch saying i'm not a witch uh, 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 but when the witch say that the witch is a witch, even though the witch is wicked, it's still a level of integrity in that the, 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 the standard is not split. It's not twisted. All right. So call evil, evil and call good, good. God tell us that woe to the generation that will come that call evil, good and good, evil. The Lord does not like it. So personal integrity means that I got inner personal honesty on the inside of me i'm honest to myself i'm honest to my thinking and you got to be honest about that I'm, I'm saving some of the stuff i really want to say for a few more minutes just bear with me let's just lay a foundation type as i'm saying this number one internal personal honesty a personal um on um inner honesty inner honesty number two integrity can be defined as the internally set to be, it can be defined as to be internally set 
on certain principles. So much so that you do not stray or waver from them. So it means that in your spirit, you are set on certain principles. You don't wave from those principles. So integrity means on the inside of me, I have certain principles that I don't override. I don't stray from them, right? So it's things that you personally believe, your personal core values on the inside of you that you believe. So this is what integrity is and you don't override them. Number three, it means to be internally and morally undivided. What do I mean by that? Internally and morally undivided. It means to not be split on the inside. You ever hear somebody say somebody is a two-faced? This is the whole idea here. So it means to not be a two-faced. All right? So it means on the inside, I'm not split. The Bible said you got to watch that man. He said, he say, um, what he thinketh in his heart, so is he. But what he didn't realize, everybody quote that part of the scripture. But what the Bible was telling you is the man was saying, eat, eat, eat. But in his heart, he was judging you. He was saying, oh no, go ahead and, you know, um, enjoy, enjoy. But in his heart, he was really hoping you wouldn't enjoy it. And so the Bible says, you got to watch how man is. Because as the man really thinks, that's what he really is. So the words can sound good, but on the inside, you're split. You can tell somebody, I love you, but on the inside, you hate them. You can tell somebody, no, I forgive you, we cool. And then, but on the inside, you're really avoiding them and making excuses for it. So it means you're not really honest on the inside and you're split, right? That's what that means to be split in your soul. But integrity means to be undivided on the inside of you. Thank you, Miko, for helping me write in this. It means to um, not be split on the inside. All right? So there's some things right now that I refuse to budge about. I, I don't care. People judge me for it. People send me email over it. People write me up for it. But I'm, I'm bent on it because until Jesus comes, I'm going to maintain those values. Even if people don't understand and don't agree with them, you don't have to agree with me, but I'm not going to split who God has called me to be on the inside to accommodate how you feel. That's what it means to be set. And then it also means, number four, to be self-accountable. Self-accountability and self-awareness that governs your moral conduct. Self-accountability and self-awareness. So I'm personally accountable to myself. Okay, April, you didn't um, work out today. You don't deserve that uh, chocolate that you have on your dresser next to your bed. Okay, you got to hold yourself accountable. All right. So it's also awareness, self-awareness. All right. I ain't going to say nothing because I'm aware of myself. I know I'm going to cuss them out. So I don't want to cuss them out. So I'm just going to go. I'm going to sit in the back for right now. All right. So it means, look, I'm accountable, but I'm also aware of how I am. I'm aware that if you upset me, I'm going to draw back. I'm aware that if you hurt me, I'm going to shut down. I'm aware, you know, I might throw things. I might, it's, you got to be aware of yourself. There's no way. That you can walk in any level of integrity and you're not aware of yourself. Alright? You can't even grow in any level of strength of character without being fully aware of who you are. And so you got to have self-accountability and self-awareness that governs the conducts. It governs our conduct. It governs our motives. It, govern, it governs our desires and our morality. You got to be aware and you got to be accountable that's what integrity is to be self-aware and self-accountable and to be governed by self-accountability and self-awareness to be governed your life is governed by by you watching over your own spirit to make sure you maintain the standards that you personally believe in then lastly it is to be absolute to be absolute in your moral standards to be absolute in your moral standards. What does that mean? It simply means there's some stuff you just absolutely just won't do. Just you as a person, you just I'm just I don't care who gets offended, what gets affected. There's just some stuff I just absolutely cannot do. I, I can't do it. I just at this level of my life. I can't do it. My conscience is too awake and I'm too aware. Like some things I see people do and get away with it. In the back of my head, I'm thinking, man, 
I just, you know, sometimes, you know, you want to just play hit back and you be like, man, you can't even think to do that. Because if you even think to do it, you end up fasting and praying for, for three to seven days just because you thought it. Because that thing, you're uncomfortable. That thing can live there. Why? Because there's just some stuff in your spirit you just absolutely will not do. Don't worry, we're going to get into the meaty, juicy part in a second. Just bear with me. I got to lay this foundation. Then I'm going to give you the practical tools. And then I'm going to release you for this evening. And we'll see you at Bible study for tomorrow. Hallelujah. So it needs to be absolute. I just absolutely won't. I made up my mind that... I had an abortion before, but after I experienced what an abortion does, not just spiritually, what I did, because yes, God can forgive me, but the mental trauma I suffered for 10 years because of one abortion, in my mind, I made up my mind, I said, I don't care if I'm walking on the street and I get raped. I am absolutely not going to consciously have an abortion. I'm, I'm not doing it. So there's just some things I just absolutely I'm just absolutely not going to do it. It didn't matter if I grew up seeing it happen. I just personally made up my mind. I'm, I'm, ju I'm, I'm just absolutely not going to do certain things. Now, there's some stuff. I don't know what I'll do. I'm being honest with you. I hope I would do the thing that looks right and good. But the truth is, there's some areas in my spirit and in your spirit that haven't been tried as yet. So you don't know what you'll do. I've never been tried in the area of adultery. I don't think I would shoot nobody, but I don't know. I don't have a gun, but I don't know what I'll do. I'm hoping as a Christian who understands integrity and the word of God that, you know, okay, we could probably go to counseling and, 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 and work it out after, a, you know, something or, you know, I'm hoping I'll do that. But every one of us, there's a measure of your own spirit that you don't even know. You are still discovering who you are. That's why self-honesty and awareness is so important. Because it helps self-honesty and self-awareness helps in self-discovery. I don't know. Self-honesty and self-awareness helps to develop and de help, help you to discover self. Self-honesty and self-awareness helps you to discover self. Now, I don't know what I would do if somebody would molest my children. When I was molested, I forgave. I'm healed now, all right? There was a part of my mind that was traumatized for many years and I couldn't trust nobody around my kids. Now I'm at the place where in my heart, I don't know if it would hit me in the place where I would take it so personal or how I would react. I don't know because I've never been tested in those areas. So, but I'm hoping because I love God, I'm gonna do the right thing. So what I'm saying is, to be absolute, right? There's some things you're going to be absolute on. I was able to be absolute on the abortion decision. Why? Because after the trauma that I went through, I know absolutely I don't care. I'm, I'm not doing it again. Ever. Ever. No. No, no, I'm not doing it again. You know, I was with this guy. I couldn't. I hated the guy. Oh, my God. After like a little while, I couldn't stand him. And I remember thinking to myself, God, if I am pregnant, I am stuck with this child for the rest of my life. Because even though I hate this guy, like I develop a real hatred for him. Because even in sin, I had that thing absolutely in me. I'm not going to go through that trauma again. But there are areas in all of our lives. We don't know what we're, we will do. There's things that I can't make a decision on. As yet, because my life experience haven't brought me to that level of wisdom or counsel as yet. And so, as you're growing in self-awareness and, and, and self-accountability, right? You're discovering more of who you are. That's why the bedrock of integrity is personal honesty. And that's actually the number one way that you practice personal integrity. Now, this whole thing right here that I just mentioned, bring me to the point of... Of the level of integrity that you walk in. So all of what I just explained about the abortion. And I don't know if I'll end up on D-block. You know, if my husband, I mean, he's faithful. He's been loyal and faithful to me. That man has integrity. It's not, it's, I don't worry about him. You know, uh, and I'm thinking, okay, I don't know what life brings, okay? Or what God will allow to come in my life. I just live every day trying to obey God the best I can, all right? But let me show you something. How do you know 
what's really in you. You think you could, I could sit down here. Did you know they did a study? They did a study on the pastors in America that has committed adultery. And when they did the interview and put the whole survey and everything together, they said over 90%, you can do the whole research and see, percent, actually almost 100% of the pastors that actually committed adultery were the ones that were convinced that they would never, ever do it. That's why the Bible says, let him that think that he stand it, take heed lest he fall. You, the person that's, I'll never, ever do that. Look at Peter, Jesus, I'll never, ever deny you. I'll never leave you. Oh, they would do it, but me, I'll never do it. And as soon as they betrayed Jesus, he was gone. So the way you measure your integrity is measured by two things in your life. Number one, in times of pleasure and in times of pressure. You will see the quality of your integrity in times of pleasure and in times of pressure. Why? Because there are parts of you that you're not acquainted with. You didn't even know that you could cuss until you got angry enough. You didn't even know that, that you could be mean and selfish. There's things that I thought I just would never ever do. Never ever like it just could never happen to me. I remember judging people in, in, in the church. I, I, I was there in Jamaica. I use this story all the time. This young lady, she decided to go have sex outside of marriage. So you know it's sin. And she decided to get pregnant. The audacity. And holy righteous, super perfect me, uh-huh, was so offended. But who was sleeping around? I mean, fell. I didn't even fell. I mean, I fall. I mean, I fall like lightning. I was so shocked at how quick I could drop my pants. I was shocked at how quick I could have entertained that thought. So there's areas of your life that you don't even know what really lives there until God really tries it. And the trying of who you really are is going to be expressed or revealed in times of pleasure and in times of pressure. Now what do I mean by that? So when pressure or pain or persecution comes, what happens? When pressure, pain, persecution comes, what happens? You are going to be able, it's going to reveal your standards. When pressure come, you know if you sleep around for money. When pressure come, you know if you lie on your taxes to get extra from the government. When pressure come, you know if you rob your boss. When pressure comes, that's when you know you don't know what's really in you sometimes. You can sit there and talk about how wonderful you think you are. But when that thing is tried in your spirit, you're going to really know who you really is. You faithful until pleasure shows up. Oh, I'll never be unfaithful to my spouse. I, every single day I get up when and I'm mindful because I'm not I'm not above falling into any kind of sin. I'm not above it. And I've learned my lesson very well growing up in this Christian walk. So every day I'm mindful in my spirit to pray and guard those areas. I lost only after my husband. I have mind only after Lincoln George Coffee. That's the only man I want. I gotta, I gotta possess my spirit and fortify my mind because I don't want, I don't know how temptation will come. I don't know how temptation will come. Because if you sit there and you think, oh, I'm above committing adultery, especially, oh no, that's a man thing. Only men do that. You're a woman, your husband is not pleasing you or meeting your needs emotionally and mentally and physically. And you're upset with your husband and you go to the store and this guy is like, oh, hello. And then he wants to help you pick up the groceries and all of that. And you don't even realize there's a weak spot in your mind because it's not fortified and it's not addressed. And you wake up thinking, oh, no, I just would never do that. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And so you don't really know the level of integrity that you're going to that you're really at until certain things come. Right? I don't even know the level of some friendships I have until moral decisions have to be made. I had a friend, and when we were in the world together, it was okay when I know she was sleeping around on her husband. I didn't like it, but I mean, that was my friend, and we were out clubbing anyhow, so she could have sleep around. I don't care. 
So you know I got saved now when the conscience of Christ and his mind is now living on the inside of me. And, and something in me begins to hate that falsehood. It begins to hate the sin. And so I couldn't bear on her anymore. So our friendship didn't got separated because, um, you know, because she was not a nice person. She's a sweet, kind person, but she never had integrity in her marriage. And as a Christian that is not bearing the mark of Christ in my spirit and in my mind and in my daily life, I could no longer hang around that. So a lot of what's in your life is going to be measured when pleasure comes and when pain comes. We saw it with Job. Job said he maintained his integrity and he sure did. He did have some moments. He did feel his anger. He was mad at God at one point. He complained. He did all of that. But he did not stop praising God. He did not stop trusting God. He said, even though he slay me, I'm still going to trust in him. What do I mean by that? When hardship came, he lost everything. Except the wife. That tell him to curse God and die. He lost everything. But he maintained his integrity. So you don't know who you really are until pleasure and pressure comes. If you want to see who you really are. When opportunities of pleasure and pressure comes, hear the first thought that runs through your mind and you'll really see where you're really at. You know how I know that I lack love or how I know I'm bitter? Let the first sign of somebody offending me and doing me something and the first thing that I could hear jump out my mouth or jump out in my mind and I could hear my own spirit who is right judging my soul saying you see that april that part of you is not crucified i could hear my inner man shouting it in the top of my head it's not you miss april knock knock that part of you ain't crucified because i could hear myself saying i did see that nasty facebook post oh god and i would the first thing i would hear you think the first thing i would say is oh my god i just can't believe oh my god i just so forgive them Oh, you, 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 so amazed. You know what I hear in my mind? Oh, Lord God. I already, at the first thing jump in my head was, oh, I want to do the same thing and tap them. And I could hear my inner man saying, that's it. That's why I'm glad they could do that to you. Because now it tells me where you're at. I know I got to regress. I know I got to practice self-control because I got to be true to my own spirit because my integrity is not empowered by my feelings. Because if it was empowered by my feelings, it would be a whole nother story. Come on now. It would be a whole nother story. But because it's empowered by the Holy Ghost, I have to keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And don't say a word. But God allow these things to come. Whether they be pressure or problems, situation, necessities, persecution, slander, accusation. God is going to allow all of it to come to do what? To measure where you're at. That's why when you jump in hot water, don't measure who throw the water on you. Measure the burn in your spirit. Measure the heat you feel. Because if you're angry and that thing is there, it could be that God who loves you so much allow the situation to show you where you're at in your spirit. Which brings me to our final part for this evening's Power Monday Evening Empowerment. I hope you've been enjoying your time with me so far. I have not yelled in a while. Oh my God, I feel my throat going like, oh, I'm going to feel this when I'm done. Because you know, once I get excited and I start talking about Jesus, I tell people all the time, I can't even whisper. Like, like if I want to talk to you and it's private and I have people in my house, like I got to drive my car outside. Like I can't even whisper. You know, when my husband used to tell me I'm loud, talking about integrity, he's like, you're loud and you're always yelling. And he would tell me, don't yell at the people in the church. And if I start yelling and raising my voice, he'll start saying stuff like, he start checking me like a temperature. Uh, you, uh, 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 uh. And I was like, I'm not loud. I'm not yelling. And you know, my mother, she tried to tell me my whole life. And I was like, what's your problem? You're, you're loud. You're, you're yelling. And so, and so I just would be like, oh, no, I'm not loud. You, because I felt it was judgmental. But if I would take the time to be honest, I would realize I'm extremely loud and deafening to be honest. But um, what I'm saying is, now here we run over to the steps of practice. I'm just not a quiet person. It's true. Hold on. Let me comment right down. Oh, I'm thirsty. Mm. I'm trying to figure out what that is because 
Maybe I've had some caffeine from yesterday at church. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so let's finish this up. Let's finish this up. So here we go. This part here is going to be really good. This is the part you don't want to miss. Don't forget to share. Tag everybody that you know. All of your friends. All the peeps that you love. Tag them. Here is where I'm going to show this. This is going to help you because, guys, this helped me. I'm learning every single day. People think that just because I'm in the word and I love God and I'm doing my best to serve God the best I know how. All right. Like I don't have thoughts. I don't have temptation and I'm not measured in my own spirit. So here we go. Number one, to practice personal integrity. Let's run through this as quickly as we can. Number one, you got to not lie to yourself. Come on, put it in the chat. It's going to get tight. Right now, it's going to get really sticky. But I hope you would hear me by the spirit. I mean, if you're watching this and you're really judging me <laughs> to be something else other than this, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to pray for you. Or you need to pray for me. But I mean, if you measure my spirit and you know, because I don't want that if it gets tight, you know how people can feel, you know, oh, I'm not talking about nobody. I'm so glad I don't know out of everybody that's there except who's texting right here. I don't know who is on. So they said, I'm not throwing no words at nobody. I'm just letting you know this thing is going to get tight because what? It's tightening something on the inside of us. And I had to do these things with my own life. So we, we all going to do this together. It's integrity um, one on one. All right. So how do we practice personal integrity? Now we understand Galatians 5.25 tells us, Amplified Version says it best to walk in personal integrity. You got to practice brutal self honesty what 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 did i just say what did i just nikia i love what you say so much i want to be able when i hear the word i don't want to step toe around stuff i'm like god if i'm nasty don't hide that's why i love my husband so much i love my husband so much because he don't cut no corners with me I respect that man so much because he don't cut no, listen to me. He would tell me the truth. He don't even care that I'll be saying, listen, I love you, but I don't love you so much that I can't tell you the truth. I love you too much not to tell you the truth. And just to be blatantly honest, I want when the word comes in my spirit, I want to hear God. Like I'm going back even on a message yesterday. I'm like, God. I see areas where I can be carnal. And I mean, the whole time from yesterday till today, I'm, 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 I'm tempering that area because during the word yesterday when pastor was preaching, I could feel it hit something within my own spirit. And I said, God, that is something I need to work on. And I was like, thank you, Holy Spirit. So today I was mindful of it because I realized that when I get to a certain point in my day or if I have certain stuff that I have to get done. I notice how, how I can be even towards people, how I manage my space. And I saw this little stench, like there was a breach in me. And I saw that, okay, that is something you have to temper, right? And so you got to be honest. Let this word slap you. Let it go in you and cut you. The Bible says the word of the Lord converts the heart. That's the cutting is for conversion because when you cut something and when you burn something, it will never, ever, ever look the same. It will never look the same. When you cut and when you burn something, it will never look the same. So when the Bible says the word of the Lord converts the heart. So if you want to be converted as a Christian, you got to let the word get in. So number one, you got to be brutally honest with yourself. I'm going to give you these scriptures because I'm going to run through this. We probably will spend about 10, 15 minutes here max and then we're done. And then next week I will come back. Remember I tell you, I got like 14 things the Lord gave me. So I'll see what we will do on next time when we get back. All right. Okay. Okay, good. All right. So number um, Galatians 6 and verse 3 says this. Galatians 6 and verse 3 says, if anyone thinks he is something special. When in fact he is nothing special. He is nothing special except in his own eyes. He deceives himself. If your integrity is measured only by your standard, you deceive yourself. You deceive yourself. 
You think you're something and you're not. Whether it be good or bad, you're deceiving yourself. Both ways. You could be excellent and the devil tell you and convince you that you're not excellent. You still deceive yourself and know you can't produce excellence. So good or bad, the principle of integrity is the same. So number one, you got to be, say, write it. I have to be brutally honest with myself. Self-deception. Self-deception is at the root of the lack of integrity. Self-deception is at the root. My God Almighty. It's at the root of the lack of integrity. I grew up thinking I would never, ever in my life, ever, 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 ever sleep with somebody else's husband. Because I grew up seeing crazy stuff. And you know what I did in my um, early adult years? Yeah, sleep with other people's husband. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because, because knowledge and integrity is not the same thing. Integrity has to be practice. You got to be honest with yourself. You got to be, because the lack of the, the, the self-deception, just because it sounds good. I, I thought it was good to, I'll never do that. Oh no, I'll, I'll never, I'll never ever, oh me, I'll never, I'll never ever ever. You, if that thing is living in you, you're deceiving yourself, you're, you're going to lack integrity. And you're not going to walk upright. So you got to practice to be honest with yourself before you can correct anything in you. So you have to practice being honest with yourself. If you don't like so-and-so, don't pretend. Don't pretend. Be kind. You don't got to like people to, to be kind to them. Be kind. But on the inside of your spirit, no, be honest so you can work out that bitterness. Don't I'll be like, oh no, I'm busy today. No, I'm not busy. I just don't like you. Like, be honest. The brutal honest, brutally honest. Brutal honesty. Be honest. No, I, I don't like that. I don't, I don't want to call you because every time I call you, you want to gossip about the people in the church. And so I'm avoiding you. Be honest. Be honest. If you're ugly on the inside, you're ugly. Be honest about it. All right? Because self-deception is at the root of the lack of integrity. Number two, let's run. We're keeping it running. Number two, you have to develop a hatred for falsehood. You have to start hating the things that are phony and false. Put it in the chat. I must develop a hatred for falsehood. Because if you don't develop a hatred for falsehood, you're not going to be honest with yourself. Sometimes I would, like I said, okay, how do you practice honesty with yourself? You got to allow, to, you got to allow yourself to think. Allow yourself to think. Have you ever been left alone in your own thoughts? I'm not talking about those of us that have a bunch of demons. That you just need deliverance. You got like 50 different voices in your head. I remember there were days I had, I felt like 20 people were talking in my head. Oh, that's how I knew I had demons. Because I, I never knew what it's like to just sit here and just have one voice in my head. I can hear when demons come and attack my mind. But I used to have a bunch of demons in me. And so I would hear one demon here, another demon. And man, I was so confused. So I'm not talking about that. And I practice leaving myself to my own thoughts. Sometimes I'm watching TV and you know, I like those, um, those, um, how you call it? Those justice stuff. Like, I, I, I like, um, I watch snap. I like forensic science and, and forensic files and, you know, um, stuff like that. Because I like to see how those things play out. But let me tell you something. When I'm watching those things, you know what? I could hear myself. Cause, and in that moment of entertainment, amusement, my mind is left open and I can hear and it's not the devil. I could hear myself saying, you know what I would do, man, if I would, I would ever, I could hear within me. Have you ever just hear yourself say some crazy foolishness? I was driving the other day 
And I thought about it. I said, man, if the popo come now, I'm just going to drive off and run. I start mapping out the way in front of me because I knew I was speeding. But instead of me dealing with the fact that, hey, yo, hey, you, Miss Coffee, you pastor, preacher lady, you, you above the, the, the speed limit. You ain't above the law, but you above the speed limit. And in the back of my head, I was down there on the road and I said, I wonder if the popo come, I could probably turn through there. Then I start thinking, <clears throat> maybe if I could run to my house and open the gate quick and go in the garage and speed, they, they couldn't even find me. And it, it sounds funny right now, but I'm being honest with you. Have you ever left yourself to think and hear what's in you? And that's when I know that I have something crooked in that side of me. I said, you see, you not, that thing there can spill over in another area in your life if you don't check that. But we don't practice brutal self-honesty. Y'all know what I'm saying. We don't practice brutal. Okay. You know, one of the things, the features I had to take off of my phone. Let me show you what I'm saying, guys. When I say we got to be honest and we have to hate falsehood. I have an iPhone, so it's the smartest phone in the world. And for the record, Jesus does use iPhones because he is the I am that I am. All right. And so I got an iPhone. And one of the features I had to disconnect from my phone was I am driving. Because there are times when I'm driving and I pick my phone up to look for a number, to look at something. I do it. I'm not going to, oh, I don't, you know, you don't text and drive. Okay, it's not something I practice every time I get in my car, I'm texting and driving. But this time I'm driving two hours. I'm driving to Austin to do something. I mean, I'm not going to not, not use my phone. And what used to happen is every single time that thing comes up when I pick up my phone and it won't open because it says I am driving and then I am physically driving. But I got to say, I'm not driving. Every time I press, I'm not driving. I could feel a dagger in my soul. And I said, uh-uh. I'm practicing to lie. I can't do this. So I disconnected that feature because every time that I'm driving and I tech and I press, I'm not driving. I'm training my spirit man to lie. I'm training my spirit man to not be honest. Those are the things I'm talking about, guys. Those are the, it sounds small and it sounds simple, but it's the small little foxes that spoil the vineyard because we don't know what that little small ungoverned area can turn into. A monster that could destroy my work in the house of God, my work in the kingdom, my family. I don't, I can't measure where that lack of integrity when I'm driving and using my phone can take me. I can't measure it. So I disconnected that feature. I practice safety. Yes, I do. But at, as much as I can, I do what I need to do. But I could not keep doing that because every time I press that button, I felt something in my spirit got grieved, man. It sounds simple to some of y'all. But within my own spirit, that's being honest, I could hear my spirit judging it as that's a lie. That, that's a lie. You just lied, April. And so I disconnected it so not violate my conscience. You got to hate falsehood. Proverbs 13, 5 to 6, it says, Lovers of God hate what is phony and false. But the wicked are full of shame and behave shamefully. Wicked people don't care. They don't care. The Bible said the woman that commits adultery go and shrug her shoulder and said, whatever, I don't care. Because they're false and phony on the inside, so I don't care. But righteousness is like a shield of protection, people of God. Guarding those who keep their integrity. When you walk in integrity, righteousness will be a shield around you. But sin will be your downfall. Let's keep running. Number three, so you got to develop a hatred for, um, thanks Nikia for the scripture. You got to develop a hatred for falsehood, right? Even if it is in you. That's the part that even if it's in you. I hate certain things. I don't like it. Even if I find myself doing it, I, I go whoop myself in the prayer room. I, I don't, if I don't, if it's not a standard of God and my spirit has an understanding, even if falsehood is found within your own spirit, you hate it. Number three, honestly compare your private life to your public life. Who are you when people are not around? Be honest. Who are you when people are not around? That's how you walk in personal integrity. Would I watch this movie if my pastor was here? 
Would I read this article? If my husband was sitting next to me? If my wife was in this room, would I be on this site? You have to ask yourself, how does my private life and my personal life look? If, 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 if I would come to find you right now in your own person, if you would have come right in here in my space, would you find me practicing what I preach right now? You have to ask yourself that question in your own spirit. Compare your private life and your personal life. Then this next one here is something I made up my mind like two years ago. I've not perfected it, but I've made up my mind. I'm going to do a practice of this. Practice to be a person of your words, even when it is difficult or even if others may not understand. So you see how my personality is, right? Let me read it again for you. Practice to be a person of your word. Even if people don't like it, or even if it's difficult for you. Psalm 50, Psalms 15 and verse 4 says, God, this is, it talks about the quality of the person that ascend into the things of God, right? It says, those who despise flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord and keep his promises even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. Lord have mercy. Even when it hurts. So you see how my personality is. I love people. I really do. I love people. No matter what people do to me, I, I love people. I genuinely in my spirit, I'm not just saying it. I have a deep love for people. All right. I've came very far from hating people to loving people. I mean, blatant hatred to have the kind of heart that God has given me right now. So I love people. And so I, I struggle with um, over promising and under delivering. And so people used to get angry at me. And some people think I'm fake and phony. And I remember, I mean, what a person and I had to have a conversation. I'm like, you see how my life is. The least you could have done is just to remind me. So we can have good intentions, but we don't have a practice of following through. And so I have to literally put my whole life on a schedule because I would have people getting offended with me. So I would be able to do something for somebody that I'm not able to fulfill this. And people are merciless. When people feel obligated and as if you're obligated to them, people are merciless. They don't care that you got a personal life. They don't care that you got, they just care about what you need to do for them. And so I had to readjust my whole life over the last two years. And this is something I'm still perfecting. So I made up my mind. I said, no, I'm not going to get up and run out my way just to go get you a gift so you can feel loved and accepted. If you don't believe I love you and accept you enough, I mean, that's on you. So I schedule one time in the month where I go and I buy all the birthday gifts to the people I want to celebrate. And that's when everybody gets celebrated because I got to throw it in my own self. It's something I love to do, but I used to over promise and I had to stop going and dates with people. So I only have a few people now in my life that I can actually be around. One of my closest best friend, right? I literally, I mean, I have few people. Y'all know all of my friends. Anyhow, my friends so close to me, we get to hang out four times a year. Four times a year. I have people in my life that I'm not even close to that sometimes will make you feel obligated to them. I'm not obligated to none of you. My integrity is within me. What I do, I do out of love and because I love you. And so everybody's not patient enough. And I would be like, okay, you know, I want to go. I used to remember every week I have to be scheduling dates. Nobody never tell me as a pastor I never had to do that. I went to other churches and find out th these pastors... They don't even spend no time with their people. And I'm over here being chastised because I haven't gotten to you yet. So I had to regulate my whole life. So I won't hurt people because I over promise and I under deliver. So I had to stop everything I was doing. It was hard. There were people I had to apologize to because I was not able to fulfill those things. And I had to regulate how I was going to live my life now. And so I don't do all those bunch of dates anymore. So when somebody don't show up to a church fellowship, they just miss the opportunity to hang with me because I have kids. I have personal stuff I'm trying to do. And so this is what I'm able to give. Now there are people in my life that I have to have one-on-one -on -one time with them because of the level of our relationship. But I had to readjust everything in my life to be a person of my word. 
So sometimes it's not that you're wicked and evil, but you don't have a proper way to practice being a person of your word. There's people that it's on my list. I now have a to-do list. I showed somebody a to-do list the other day. They couldn't believe it. I showed somebody what my calendar looked like and my alarm clock. Because that's how I know, okay, Wednesday, I got to do this. I got to pick this up for so-and-so. I got to go on Amazon. I got to buy this for so-and-so. Because I want to honor my word to people. I have this young man, I promise him I'm going to do 13 miles walk for him. And every day the thing is on me. I said, I'm going to get up. I'm going to just go around my park one day. All right, drink some Red Bull or some energy drink or something and go walk that thing out and, and, and screenshot the 13 miles and send it to him. Because I promised him that so it's on my heart. Don't give yourself any rest until you honor your word. That's so you practice integrity. There's a lady that's no longer at our church, right? And so at the time, I pledged and vowed in my heart and I shared it with Pastor Damiero what I'm going to do for this team of women. So even though the, the lady is no longer at the church, whether she accepts the gift or not when I send it, because I said, I'm going to thank the people who helped me with this project to include you that's no longer at the church. You can burn it, you can throw it away if you want, but I'm not going to give myself any rest to, to be nasty to anybody. I'm going to honor who I am within my own spirit. And so when I'm purchasing the stuff to give to this group of women who helped me with a particular thing at the church, I included that person in it. Even though they're no longer at the church, when I send it to them, they can do whatever they want, but I am going to honor my word. No, this is practice, especially if you're a people person like me. Especially... I'm looking at September, and you know I love my church family like we give natural birth to them. And I got to look at the list. I said, oh my God, I got to go so-and-so like this. I got to drive. I'm scheduling time. I'm inconveniencing my chief armor bearer because she got to drive me all the way out of town because some of these people, their chest is just super high, and, and they want all of these things. And it's not even that they want it. It's that I love them enough to want to do these things. But I found out that if I don't slow down, Measure how I'm going. I'm going to hurt people. People are going to think I'm shady. People are going to get offended in me when the truth is I lack balance. It's not an integrity issue. It's I lack balance. So to maintain my integrity, I fix my balance. So some people are affected, but when I... Uh, especially my daughters in the church. So when I said, hey, look, we're having a woman's fellowship. That's the day I'm putting four or five hours in. I want to come. I want to hang with you. I want to chat with you. I want to spend 10, 15 minutes here, 10, 5 minutes chatting to this one, that one. Hug, hug, kiss, kiss, take pictures. Because that's the time I'm giving. Because my kids are getting older and there's more I have to do. And I'm more in love with my husband now. So I need to be with him too. So it's not, some, for some of us, it's not an integrity issue. It's a balance. So what I had to do was readjust my balance to practice integrity. Lastly, let me give you this and we will be done. I really hope this is blessing you, right? You have to ask yourself, do I believe that my actions are in line with the word of God? Every single time you come to a moment of pleasure or pressure, ask yourself this thing when you're making decisions. Do I believe that my actions line up with the word of God? Do I believe my actions line up with the word of God? Excuse me. You got to ask yourself that. Do I believe it? And the Bible says, Psalm 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against you. When there's integrity in your heart, you won't sin against God. You got to ask yourself, if I, if I continue this relationship, am I displeasing God? If I don't forgive this person, is God going to be okay with it? If I, if I walk out, is, 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 is God all right with that? So you got to measure your thoughts and your decisions by the word of God. Uh, number six, practice all levels of accountability. The person that is not accountable to nobody and only answer to themselves is a dangerous person. The person that only answers to himself or herself is a dangerous person. You got to be accountable to somebody. That's why you see men who are abusive to their wives or wives who are abusive to their husbands. And you see adultery and you see mess and crazy foolishness. You see pastors that don't get checked. They don't have nobody 
to check them. They don't have nobody to correct them. They don't have nobody to instruct them. A man that answers only to himself is a dangerous man. So you got to practice all levels of accountability. Accountability to self accountability to God and accountability to your peers. What are the levels of accountability? Accountability to self. Account Hold yourself accountable. Yes, I did it. I, sh I sure did say it. It's not right, but I did it. Be accountable to yourself. Be accountable to God, which uh, God, I did. Okay. I did put the Holy Ghost to the side for two minutes to cuss him off. I did. I did do it. Uh -huh, I, sh I did. I shouldn't have said it. I did cuss God. I did cut up on the job. I, I, it's true. Be accountable to the Holy Spirit. And then be accountable to your peers. Now, being accountable, so you can understand. Being accountable, it is a combination of self-awareness and honesty. Being accountable is a combination of I'm aware of myself. So that's why I know I'm going over to my mother in love house. We don't really get along. So I'm going to call my pastor. I'm going to let my pastor know, pastor, I'm going over. And I just need somebody I can be accountable to. Because if anything happens, I'm going to call you, all right? Because I don't want to cuss them. Mm -mm. I don't want to cuss them out. I want to be nice. So you got to allow, you got to be aware of where you're at. You don't go visit your boyfriend, fall in sin, and then call your accountability partner. You know the areas where you're vulnerable. The areas where you're vulnerable, be blatantly and upfront and honest about it. And that's when you call somebody. Don't go to the club first. Drop it like it's hot. Then I see it on Facebook. And then you come and, oh, you know, um, mom and dad, I'm just coming to be accountable. To just let you know, I was in the club. I, I did kind of get drunk. I was, I shouldn't, I shouldn't ever do it. No, that's a confession. It's not accountability. Because accountability means that there's a willingness to surrender yourself to the view and the opinion of somebody else. That's what accountability is. Accountability means you put your decision on the table to be checked and to be challenged by God, yourself, and peers. So accountability is not confession. It's not you saying, all right, now I did smoke some weed. It, it was on sale now. I was going to do some CBD by the store, you know, because they got, but, but I did, the guy run the back, you know, it was on sale now. And I, gotta, I did smoke the weed. Pastor, I'm partially high talking to you right now. I'm going to be honest. No. <laughs> Y'all stop laughing. I'm really done right now. We really finished. All right? Stop laughing. Accountability is not confession. Accountability means that the areas of my life that I'm aware that I'm vulnerable in. Right? I'm vulnerable in those areas. I surrender that to somebody that I can hear their views. I have people in my life and in my ministry, obviously people above us in leadership that we're accountable to. But I also have people, I'm accountable to Pastor Johnson, I'm accountable to Pastor Damira, I'm accountable to Titi. I know people like judging myself and my husband talking about we have a bunch of yes people around us. But if I have yes people around me with the kind of personality that I have, I would never be what God wants me to be. I don't, why would I need yes people around me? What can yes people do for me? I need people who we can respect each other and be honest with each other. So I have people that I'm accountable to, even in my church. Obviously, I'm accountable to my husband. So I would go and I would vent. And sometime when I'm venting, I can hear pastor check me. He said, I know you're venting, but you got to watch yourself because I heard something else in your spirit, April. So even though he loves me, he would tell me, honey, I'm your husband. I love you. But I could hear something else in your spirit. You might want to go to prayer before you have a conversation with me. See, that's why I love that man. Y'all don't understand why I love that man. Pastor Johnson, I've called Pastor Johnson. Pastor Johnson, I'm about to go off. Pastor Johnson, come get me. I'm about to go off. I'm going to say something crazy. Pastor Johnson said, Mom, don't do that. Mom, I didn't really like that Facebook post. You've seen me put posts up and have to take them back down. Mom, I don't know. I don't want, I love you, Mom. I don't want nobody to think nothing crazy about you. I know you're upset right now, but you probably need to give it three days. And I'll ask him, I said, Pastor, you think maybe something is wrong with me, Pastor Johnson? You think, and he'll be like, Mom, you probably, you're upset right now. You probably should calm down. You got to be accountable. You got to, the areas where you're vulnerable. Because I'll be like, Pastor, I don't know. I'll go to Pastor Damier. I'll be like, Pastor Damier, I don't know if I want to be around so-and-so. Pastor Damier, I'll be like, Mom, calm down. You know, I really don't think so-and-so meant it like that. It's not that I can't make 
those judgments for myself like I'm not sensible. The thing is, because I have relationship with these people, when I get to my most human place, I'm not talking deep and spiritual like some of us that just think we live in the glory cloud. You can live in the glory cloud if you want. I have to go to the glory cloud every day. And the days when I don't go to the glory cloud, you better stay far from me because I don't want to see what I'm like if the flesh ain't crucified and my spirit ain't submitted to Jesus every single day. So you have a different testimony. God bless you. But there's areas of my life when my humanity is fully exposed. I need people around me, not yes man and yes woman. I don't build relationship with yes man and yes woman because you can't take me and the call of God on my life nowhere. And that's why I appreciate Bishop Roberts, Bishop Bismarck, Bishop Smith. My God, you know why? Because they love me and with a straight face. Bishop Roberts especially, Bishop Smith. Oh my God. April, you carnal. You're not submitted in that area. That's why I can appreciate that. So what I'm saying is practice proper accountability. Don't, don't, don't just be accountable to people you like that will tell you what you want to hear. Be accountable to people that will tell you what God wants to hear. Even like I was telling you with Titanium, my armor bearer, as close as we are. And yes, I'm her spiritual mom. I would hear her. She could say, mom, I know how you're thinking. But I can be honest, I feel in my heart, this is this. And she's respectful, always has been. And I'd be like, you know, I probably do need to calm down. You're probably right. I could look at it differently. What I'm saying is practice proper accountability. Surround yourself with people. My friend, Pastor Tasha, that's my confidant. Tasha Johnson, everybody knows her. Uh, that's Apostle Duane's wife. So Tasha and I were very close. So there's times in my life, I'm going through a moment. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to call Tasha. Jesus, I know I hear you. Ooh, but I'm, I'm going to call Tasha because I know she's going to talk me down. She's going to talk me down. She's going to be like, sis, I'm going to pray for you right now. But I'm telling you, you don't need to do that. And she taught me all the way down. You got to practice proper accountability to yourself, to God, and to others if you're going to do this thing right. We are right about this time. We are done now. I spent some good time with you. I miss you so much. And so the last part is you got to ask yourself the ultimate question. What are the consequences and what are the rewards of my actions? The ultimate question is what are the consequences and the rewards of my actions? You got to ultimately ask yourself that question. How will what I'm doing affect people. That's why you got to surround yourself with the proper accountability. The Bible says in the counsel of many, there is safety and there is victory. There is victory in war. You can get victory in spiritual warfare. You can get safety through the counsel of many people. Get, find, surround yourself with the godly counsel and then ask yourself, what are the consequences? There are things Sometimes I get angry and I want to do it. And in the back of my head, I said, how is this going to affect Nikia? How is this going to affect Pastor Johnson? How is this going to affect Pastor Coffee? How is this going to affect my bishop? I got to think, what are the consequences? Okay, if I, if I, if I do this right now, I'm going to feel good. But who's going to pay the cost? Who is gonna, I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about things you do because you have to do. There's things I have to do that people hate me for. Like, I mean, I have people in my life now that hate me. I mean, hate me because I made up my mind I'm gonna maintain a certain standard. Well, until Jesus comes, this is just what I'm gonna do. I'm not talking about you standing up for the truth. Like, I don't drink liquor and you wanna drink liquor and think as a Christian you can go and have a gig in the club. I don't believe Christians should have gig in the club. So if our friendship is going to be affected because you got a gig in the club, then so be it. The Bible tells me I shouldn't even eat with you anyhow. So you get upset if you want. That's on you. So I'm not talking about that kind of a stuff where you have to make hard and fast decisions. I'm talking about when you make personal self-decision. If I wear this to church, what are the people going to say? Is it going to be a distraction? How are they going to feel? So don't just get up and live your life. It's my life. It's my clothes. I spend my money for it. Y'all can't tell me what to do. It's my stuff. And I'm not, not. No, don't do that. I'm sorry. I'm so dramatic. I really was <laughs> folding up my stuff. <laughs> don't do that. But really honestly ask yourself. If I do this now. There were days in our marriage. I never forget. You know my husband. Before now. Now we're so in love. And it's a real place. It's not just. We're not walking on eggshells. Tiptoeing around each other. 
We've, we've, we've argued to be where we're at. We had hard arguments to be where we're at. And I remember there were days I could just hear myself saying, I just want to pack up and leave. I just want to pack up and leave. And I begin to think, if I walk out of my marriage, how is this going to affect my ministry and the people that God has called to me that look to my marriage as an example? What am I telling them that God can't fix no marriage? Then I thought about my kids. I'm like, I was raised up without a father. I already know what that's like. Why would I want to make my son and my daughter be raised like this? I see what the stability of having mom and dad around do to them. And I sit myself down and cry in the closet by myself. I mean cry. And there were days I had to cry and beg God. God help my heart because I was so angry with him. He wasn't loving me the way that I wanted. He didn't understand me. At least I thought so. And I had a lot of these things in my heart. But what kept us and why I fought through those hard times was I saw the faces of people. I don't know why I'm getting emotional. But I saw the faces of people that we loved. I said, so many people have quit. So many people have given up. I see big mega passes on the front line getting divorces and it's giving me gut punch in my stomach. I said, somebody have to show people that this thing can work. Even in the pain, this thing can work. And I've been able to be healed, to be restored and to have the liberty we have in our marriage. Right now, I said, my daughter came in a few days ago. She said to her, dad, she said, dad, I don't know what happened. But you're always now running behind mommy and you're always all over her just kiss kissing her. I don't know. Mommy's usually the one doing this. It's not that the tables has turned. It's just we have walked into another level of intimacy and fellowship that, that it, it does something that we can't help ourselves but to respond that way. But what you see is the beauty and oh mama that's so mushy. But you weren't there when we had to be accountable to our bishop. You weren't there when we had to work through the ugly. You weren't there when we had to cry the tears. So guys, you got to work through the thing honestly, intentionally, and with accountability and awareness. And think about the consequences. This has been your teaching on practicing personal integrity. I really hope today that you guys were really, really blessed. Let us know that you were blessed. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sowing. Thank you for being a great support to Open Fire. Thank you for praying for us. Because y'all know it's not easy out there. Every church and every pastor I know is going through right now. It's not easy out there. But I know the Lord is with us. And I thank you guys for your prayers and your love and your support. I pray today you were blessed. You were challenged. You were challenged. I pray you were challenged. And I pray you were really also encouraged. And you see different areas. And you'll be able to manage them better now. I want to challenge you before you go to your bed tonight. Spend some time in your inside and hear yourself think to see the areas you need to work on don't hide yourself from yourself by deceiving yourself be honest shakespeare be true to yourself be honest about who you are on the inside what you feel what you think and then you bring correction to those areas in your life i love you guys dearly thank you for being with us today i am gonna see you uh tomorrow evening i'll be in the house 6 p.m for intercession Dad and I will be at Bible study. We're excited to be home and to be at church. Pastor Coffee will be there with us as well. And I'll be teaching Bible study. We're going to continue the Jesus culture. And I want to talk about the level of manifestation of Christ. Because I don't just want Jesus to just be spoken. I want him to get into the material of who you are. I want to show you practically how to live this thing out. So the life of Christ can be fully expressed through you. Listen, I love you guys. The Lord bless you. The Lord Jehovah our God and keeper keeps you cause his face to shine on your life and the Lord who is gracious and kind give you his peace I love you dearly thank you for your love thank you for your prayers and thank you for your support God bless you Pastor April signing out goodbye